Okay, so it's really late, and I'm not going to be able to just stand up here and talk and have any chance at all. So, uh, I, let's see. I need a four-credit student to uh, volunteer. All right, come on up. No, come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, and I'm going to need other volunteers too, and so you just get ready to volunteer because you can't just sit passively there. Okay. Hey, Randy. I'm Lawson. Hey, Lawson. Um, uh, yeah, it's uh, there's no amplification. It's just for the video. So this is kind of what you got here. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, what's your major, Lawson? Um. <laughs> Oh, I didn't mean to stump you with that one. Okay. Uh, I'm just kind of in an in-between phase right now. Okay. Okay. Well, at Christian colleges, we love that because yeah. that way we get all your money uh, before before you're before you're done. Okay. So um, if uh, I, I want to figure out what I can do in in an hour. That will make you walk away and say, okay, not only did I get my credit, I actually got something that was worth something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we're, we're going to see if you and I can make a covenant with the class here. All right. Uh, if I could help you have absolute crystal clarity about three of the most important things in the world, would you consider this hour a good investment? Yes. Okay, so... I'm going to check with you uh, momentarily and from time to time, and I'm going to, I'm going to try to give you crystal clarity about three really important things. Okay. okay. Are we good with that? Yeah, we're good. Okay, go sit down. Okay. Um, now, I need, uh, I need uh, two more volunteers. All right, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay. Um, and, uh, but I, I tell you what. Um, what I would like you to do first is I want you to step outside just for a moment so you can't hear what we're doing, and I'm going to call for you in just a minute, and you're going to, you're going to come up here. Okay. Let's wait for him to get Hi, I'm Randy. Kurt. Hi, Kurt. Uh, Kurt, do you have a major? I do. What was your major? Uh, I'm a Bible major. Bible major. Okay, cool. Um, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some facts. And I, I, I want you to assume that the facts I'm telling you are, are true, They're true facts, um, <laughs> as opposed to false facts. Okay. Um, and after I give you those facts, what I want you to do is give me some explanation for the facts that I give you. All right? Okay. Okay. All right. Here, here are the facts. Of the thousands of counties in the United States, uh, the ones that have the lowest rate or incidence of liver cancer are sparsely populated, mostly rural, uh, mostly in the southwest and upper midwest, and vote overwhelmingly Republican. Okay, how would, how would we explain that collection of facts? Why, why do those counties have the lowest incidence of liver cancer? They have the lowest incidence of liver cancer. Yes. Um, like percentage-wise? Right. Because they're... Lowest rate. They're right. They're lower, they, they have less people. Um, the rate is lower. The percentage oh, sorry, of people sorry, is I, I lower. <laughs> yes. Um, Republican. Yeah, Bible major. That's good. Uh, Sparsely populated, mostly rural, Midwest, you know, Southwest, Upper Midwest, and overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly Republican. Republican. Yes. Uh, liver cancer. Um, let's say. No, 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 I have no explanation for that. You have no explanation for that? Uh, Republicans <laughs> drink more, and so they have liver cancer. No, we have the no. lowest <laughs> incidence. 
Republicans. Right, that's, that's right. That's what I meant. They drink less, and so they have a lower rate. Of okay, Republicans so drink less. They may be conservative, more conservative, kind of straight arrows. Thank you. That, that is what I was thinking. Okay. Just, yeah, liver okay. cancer is closely related to drinking, so they're kind of straight arrows. Don't drink as right. much. No drinking, no liver cancer. Thank you. That was almost harder than Woo. getting Lawson to tell me about his major. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, would uh, somebody fetch him uh, for me real quick? Um, Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, now I have to ask you uh, uh, to to be quiet while while we do this because I I actually know what I'm doing. Hi, I'm Randy. I'm Trey. Hi, Trey. Uh, what's your major, Trey? Uh, mechanical engineering. Mechanical engineering. Excellent. Okay. Uh, what do mechanical engineers do? They study like problems with society, mainly doing with materials, like bridges or machines. Or okay. To fix them. Um, I'm I'm a great believer in bridge fixing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Trey. I'm going to uh, I'm going to give you some facts, and I want you to assume that the facts I'm giving you are true. I'm not just making this stuff up. These, these are true. And then what I want you to do is try to provide me with an explanation that will explain these facts. Okay, engineer, this is going to be a piece of cake for you. Oh it's a little iffy for a Bible major, we've discovered. <laughs> okay, 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 but engineering, this is going to be right down your alley. Okay. Um, in all the counties in the United States, uh, there are particular kind of counties that have the highest incidence of liver cancer. Uh, these counties are sparsely populated, mostly rural, in the Southwest and Upper Midwest, and vote overwhelmingly Republican. How would we explain that those particular counties have such a high rate of liver cancer? Clue. Really? Okay, think about it. We're got liver cancer out in the country. Is it Republicans? <laughs> rural? Is it something to do with farming? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think we've demonstrated any connection between farming and liver cancer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. They live out in the country. What would that say about medical care? Uh, they don't have as good medical Might care. Might not be as good. Um, what, what if these are the good old boys? You think they might throw back a few? Probably. Might lead to okay. liver cancer. Is that beginning to make sense? Yes. Yeah, I'm doing all the work here, bud. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, but but you're interviewing yourself. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Randy, how do you feel about this? Well, uh, okay, that's good. You can you, you can say. <laughs> okay, uh, that went about as poorly as anything I've done in a while. Um, um, okay, so what, what uh, you know, uh, Trey doesn't know is. Uh, but by the way, I should say for all of you that both of those scenarios that I gave are true. Uh, both the highest and lowest rates of liver cancer are in those counties. And it has nothing to do with how they vote. It has nothing to do with uh, who's more prone uh, to drink. It has everything to do with them being sparsely populated. Okay, because kind of think this through. Uh, let's, suppose, let's suppose you have a very small county. It just has three people in it. One of them has liver cancer. What's your rate of liver cancer? 33%. Okay, you have another county. It's got five people in it. None of them have liver cancer. What's your rate of liver cancer? Zero. So when you have small samples, they're always going to move to the extremes on both sides. Everybody still with me? Okay, I know it's late, it's got to be with me. What's interesting is, we hate that. 
And uh, every time I've, I've presented this, uh, people, and I've asked for explanations, people have immediately started to give them to me. Okay, we want a story that explains things. Uh, we, don't, we don't like randomness. We like explanations. We like stories. Okay, so what I'm going to hit you with tonight is a story. Now, I'm going to give you a moment to talk to the person beside you, and you are going to talk about the following question. You are aware that creating books in the ancient world was extraordinarily expensive. If you're going to create a book, you'd better have a very good reason. And when people wrote books, they wrote them for a reason. Luke Acts, Luke Acts, you know it's Luke Acts, right? Say yes. Okay, we have to do better than that. Um, <laughs> the worst thing that ever happened in the history of the canon was John getting stuck between Luke and Acts. I have been working relentlessly to change the order of the New Testament books. I don't know if you've noticed this is going poorly. Uh, because apparently people learn the New Testament books by learning the song. And we're unwilling to get a new song. Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, Acts would be great. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, John would be great. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts is utterly unacceptable. They go together. All right. Everybody put your hand up and repeat after me. Exactly after me. Thank you. I will not read Acts unless I read Luke first. And if I do, I will go to hell. That is how seriously I take that. Okay. Um, where, where is my, let's see, where was, where's, my, where's my Bible major? Kurt, uh, how, how, how many books, how many chapters does Luke have in it? Exactly. All right. Very good. All right. Uh, if I told you I wanted you to read Luke 25, 6, you would know what to do, right? Absolutely. What would you do? Absolutely, and because Acts 1 could just as well be Luke 25, right? Absolutely, because they go together. Now, um, by the way, you know, those of you who have a Church of Christ background, you know we really like patterns. There is a pattern in Luke Acts, an overwhelming pattern. What Jesus did, the apostles do, the early church does. That's the pattern. What Jesus does, the apostles do, the early church does. That's why you have to read them together. What Jesus does, the apostles do, the early church does. That's the pattern. You cannot understand what the early church is doing. You can't make any sense at all of what Acts is doing unless you look at it in light of Luke. And when you look at them together, things just start popping all over the place. Okay, now, here's the problem you're going to solve for me really quick by talking to the person beside you. I want to know why somebody would go to all the trouble to write this expensive book, Luke Acts. Uh, I, I want to know what it is he is trying to prove. Everybody got it? Talk to the person beside you, and you're going to come to a conclusion about why he's writing Luke Acts.
Okay, um, <clears throat> now, Luke X is not exactly like uh, Matthew, Mark, and John. Uh, you could sort of think about Matthew, Mark, and John as some form of ancient biography, but it's kind of a weird biography. Luke Acts, mm, doing something a little different. Okay, so I want to hear something uh, that you said in your conversation. Somebody, somebody raise your hand and tell me, what, why, do you, why do you write Luke Acts? Yeah. Um, I think that, I mean, other than the fact he, it was a letter that he was writing to a specific party, but I think that he probably believed that this was explaining something fundamentally important about the human race, and so it was worth writing down. Okay, what's he explaining about the human race? Okay. And this is humanity playing that out. Okay. So many ways. Very good. What else? Yes. God wants to be with the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Okay. God wants to be with the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Definitely a theme. Anybody else? <coughs> okay. So, um, Lawson, here comes our first moment of crystal clear clarity. Life changing idea. One of the reasons, one of the main reasons people wrote ancient books was this. To prove that our nation is the greatest nation. And that's what Luke Acts is doing. Luke Acts falls into that ancient kind of book that is going to prove that our nation is the greatest nation. Uh, now, if you went onto the New York Times bestseller list, there would probably be, you know, half a dozen to ten books out of the top 25 that are written to show, written by Americans to show why America is the greatest nation. People have been writing those kind of books for a long time. People in the ancient world wrote that kind of book. They were very expensive to make. So Luke comes along, he's going to write a book, and he's going to write a book about the nation called the kingdom of God. And what he's going to try to do is convince a bunch of Romans and a bunch of Jews that the kingdom of God is the greatest nation of all nations. Now, why is that important? We're coming to that moment of crystal clear clarity. Uh, this is not primarily about your salvation. You need to get over yourself. This is about a new nation. That's why Acts is so important. It is about the community of God. God's intentions are not just to save you. That is way too puny for God. Uh, God's intention is to create this holy new people. Uh, so in the same way that Acts doesn't make any sense without Luke, you don't fully understand what's going on in Luke until you see how it comes out in Acts. It's about community. Okay. I know a lot of young people have problems with the church. I've got problems with the church too, and I'm not young. Okay. The church is the point. Uh, I'm not talking about just some institutional church building. I'm talking about this new people of God is the point. Okay, I, I, I teach at um, Abilene Christian, and we have this spectacular opening chapel, and we're like Harding. We have people from uh, 
all over America and all the nations, and we have what we call the parade of flags. And somebody brings in the flag of every nation and every state that we have. And the, the second biggest cheer goes up when the U.S. flag comes in. The biggest cheer goes up when the Texas flag comes in. Uh, and, and we take all those flags and we, and we put them on flagpoles and they're, they're displayed and it, it displays the worldwide reach of Abilene Christian University. You probably do something similar here. Okay, what Luke Acts wants you to see is this. You march in that flag and then you lay it down at the foot of the cross. Because now you're a member of a new nation greatest nation that ever was. Um, crystal clear clarity, Lawson, that's number one. Okay, I'm cooking. Uh, uh, that only took, okay. Uh, okay, now I'm going to take another detour and then we're going to read some text. Uh, I want to talk about one of my favorite topics, wrongness. Being wrong. Um, okay, so you're going to have another conversation by the person sitting beside you, and this one's really fun. Uh, unless you're sitting by your spouse. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Cones. Okay. Uh, what I want you to talk about for 90 seconds with the person beside you, make sure both people get a chance to talk, is what does it feel like to be wrong? Okay, that's what you're going to talk about. What does it feel like to be wrong? All right, talk to the person beside you. Okay, <clears throat> now, how many of you were sitting beside somebody who said, I don't know yet? <laughs> okay, there's always at least one or two in every crowd. Uh, that, that one really takes some nerve if you're sitting by your spouse. Um, <clears throat> okay, there's actually a right answer to that question that I ask you. This is going to be our second moment of crystal clear clarity. It's going to take a few minutes to get clear about it. But there is a right answer to the question. Um, the, uh, the only magazine I read with any regularity is the New York Times Book Review because uh, I like to read really widely and I don't like to read off the bestseller list because it's always the same people writing the same book over and over again with a different title. So I read the Times Book Review to find interesting books. And uh, one of the other things they do besides book reviews is they interview famous people about what they're reading. Sometimes it's interesting, mostly it's not. Um, one of the interesting ones was where they were interviewing the uh, president of Harvard, uh, who uh, it was president of Harvard at the time. She's a really fine historian. And uh, they asked her, if you could have students at Harvard read only one book as they're coming in, what would you want the freshmen at Harvard to read? And she says, the book I want them to read is Being Wrong by Katherine Schultz. Uh, by the way, if you're going to read only one book this year, this is the book you ought to read. Uh, when I read that interview, I hadn't read the book, and so I quickly scurried out to read it because I hate being behind the students at Harvard. Uh, and uh, this is a book about being wrong. And among other things, she answers the question, what does it feel like to be wrong? Okay, it's going to take me a few minutes to explain this, but stick with it. Here's what it feels like to be wrong. It feels exactly the same as being right. 
stay with me here. <laughs> uh, you never have the experience of being wrong. Never. You only have the experience of having been wrong. Because the moment you realize you're wrong, you're right again. Oh. <laughs> in other words, everybody in this room thinks they're right about everything. Right? If I ask you, why do you hold such and such a view? Are you going to tell me, well, because I think it's wrong? <laughs> no, you hold this view because you think it's right. You have had the experience in the past that you've sometimes been wrong about things and you realize you might be wrong about something now, but you don't know what it is because if you did, you would change your mind and you'd be completely right again. Is everybody with me? That's why it is so hard to get anybody to change their mind about anything important. Because we always feel like we're right. Everybody still with me? Oh, I mean, come on, you're having this argument with somebody and the evidence is just piled up against you, but you're not budging. Well, my brother and I argued for years, ever since we were teenagers, about the momentous question of whether you stayed drier running or walking in the rain. <laughs> We even tried to conduct experiments, but we had no precise way to measure wetness and they were inconclusive. <laughs> Until recently, Mythbusters ran a segment on this. We now know for a fact that you stay drier walking in the rain than running. And this was information I thought my brother needed. <laughs> so I sent him an email, dear brother, I want to send you this link to Mythbusters because it shows that you stay drier walking than running in the rain. And I just thought it was important for you to know that all these years you have been wrong. <laughs> Love, Randy. <clears throat> he sends me an email back and says, that would be great, Randy, except for one thing. You forgot which side of that argument you had. <laughs> Because, because he can't admit he's wrong. Okay, uh, okay Lawson, here's, here's crystal clear point number two. This will change your life, I promise you. Um, what does it feel like to be wrong? It feels exactly the same as being right. And if you will remember that, there's an outside chance you might learn a few things in your life. Uh, because it creates a crack of openness uh, to new truth and new understanding. Uh, the four most important words in the English language is, I might be wrong. Now, I go to a great deal of trouble to get to this. It is my conviction, and, and, and by the way, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a philosophical theologian, I'm, I'm not a Bible scholar, so I'm, I'm getting ready to do kind of straight Bible here for a while, and it's important that you know I am going to be tracking along well-worn paths. That is, not absolutely everybody would agree with everything I'm about to do, but what I'm going to do is very mainline biblical scholarship. This is kind of, this is kind of the way biblical scholars uh, understand this. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of be the vehicle that's going to save you reading hundreds and hundreds of pages. Do you have a greater appreciation for me now than you did a moment ago? Okay. You know, you're not going to have to read the books because I'm going to, I'm going to get you there without reading the books. The reason I've gone to all this trouble is it is my conviction that the apostles and most of the people around Jesus had him wrong at the beginning, had him wrong in the middle, and I think even had him wrong at the end. Uh, 
And what I'm going to try to do is answer the question about why they so consistently got Jesus wrong. Uh, this has been addressed by a bunch of people. Uh, N.T. Wright spent a lot of time on it. Several other people have. And all I'm going to do is just kind of channel that, uh, that research. Um, if you would turn to Luke 25, 6, that would be Acts 1, 6, for those of you who are using the old canon. Um, <laughs> I... I have never and continue uh, to not entirely know what to do with this conversation, which is really strange. Uh, this is after Jesus' resurrection, Acts 1-6. Um, he, he, he's talking to, to the apostles and so... Acts 1, 6, when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Okay, I'm still not sure I know what that question means. Uh, but I want to take a fair crack at it. Uh, I think it exhibits a continuing misunderstanding about what Jesus is up to. Uh, and in fact, Jesus' response uh, to that is a little hard to, to translate out of the Greek. Okay, so, so Jesus' basic response to that was, hey, 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 hey. Uh, you know, might as well, might as well go. Uh, you know, Holy Spirit, good luck with this. Uh, see what I've been working with here. Um, and uh, what, I, what I want to do is kind of try to explain where uh, I think that uh, comes from. I'm, I'm try, try to explain why they so consistently got Jesus wrong and what I'm going to contend for the third and, and, and kind of crystal clarity sort of uh, idea is this. We get him wrong in exactly the same way they did. Uh, and then we'll be ready uh, tomorrow to do a close reading of some Luke passages. Okay, so what I need to do is go back to the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and uh, we're going to go to Daniel chapter 7. Um, and this is a complex passage. I'm not going to try to sort it all out. But I'm just going to kind of give you a quick, uh, quick little run through on this passage because it is very important to the faith of Israel at Jesus' time. Okay, so this is a long, complex thing. I don't, I don't want to read it all, so I've got to start someplace. <coughs> so let me start. Uh, um, oh, let's start with verse uh, 13. Okay, Daniel's got this vision of these, of these beasts that represent kingdoms, of which the last one is the most ferocious uh, verse 13, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All people, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed." I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the true meaning of all this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth. But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying. With its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell, the horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them. Until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. 
He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress the saints and try to change the set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to him for time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit. His power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey Him. Okay, this passage is absolutely crucial to the faith of Israel in the time of Jesus. There is this fourth ferocious beast who oppresses the people of God and defeats them. If you're a good Jew in the day of Jesus, you know who that fourth kingdom is, right? Who is it? Rome. You know it's Rome. And the picture is that at some point, God will raise up a heavenly warrior who is called in this passage, one like the Son of Man. And through this heavenly warrior, God will overcome this kingdom. He will establish the kingdom of God as the only kingdom in the world, restore Jerusalem as the center of the universe, and He will reign forever and ever, and this is the hope of Israel. Um, and the passage even tells us when this will happen. It will happen after time, times, and half a time. That clear it up for you? <laughs> and so they've been waiting and waiting and looking for the Son of Man. And there were people before Jesus and there were people after Jesus who came claiming to be that heavenly warrior. And the same thing happened to all of them. Uh, I, was, I was teaching a really big Bible class in a room bigger than this one. There were probably 300 people in there. And so, you know, all the students had the same name. Hey, you. Uh, <laughs> so, so a kid comes up to me after class and says, I want to ask you a question. And I said, uh, great, ask away. He says, do you know who Spartacus is? I said, what does that have to do with anything? And he says, I just want to know. I said, you mean the guy who led the slave rebellion? He says, yeah. I said, what brought this up? Did you see the movie last night? And it turns out on one of the movie channels that apparently I don't get, they were doing this uh, multiple season miniseries on Spartacus. And they were sort of leaning into all of the sex and violence, and so he was very into it. Um, and I said, okay, uh, ancient history is not really my thing, but yeah, yeah, I, I know who Spartacus is. And he says, can you tell me how it comes out? <laughs> and I said, what? And he says, well, you know, they quit, and it doesn't pick up till next season, and I want to know how it comes out. And I'm thinking, Google? Uh, <laughs> And I said, uh, yeah, I, I think I can help you out there. I said, you know, Spartacus was this guy. He led this slave rebellion. He was actually a pretty good military leader. He had some other pretty good leaders with him. And when he led that rebellion, the Romans were occupied otherwise. And so he won several battles, and they actually became a bit of a nuisance. And at some point, probably the richest man in the history of the universe financed his own army, imagine this, brought it up against Spartacus, and slaughtered them. And everybody who survived the battle, he crucified all the way down the road towards Rome. We don't know exactly what happened to Spartacus, never really found the body. He either was killed in the battle or wandered off into the hills. And he looks at me, 
and says, that's a terrible ending. <coughs> and I said, well, sorry, I, do you want him to rewrite Roman history for you? <laughs> I said, that's the way it turned out because that's always the way it turned out. And as these people appeared who claimed to be the Son of Man, the Romans slaughtered them one by one. And then this guy appears on the scene who can multiply food, heal the sick, raise the dead, which if you are looking for a military leader are three excellent things. I mean, you talk about solving your logistical problems. Um, and they are wondering, could this be the Son of Man? And I'm telling you, those people who are going out in that wilderness didn't go out there to hear preaching. They went out to see if this is the Son of Man. This is the hope of Israel. Now, I want to show you another Old Testament passage really quick. Isaiah chapter 53. This is probably one you're a little more familiar with. It's one of those suffering servant uh, songs uh, from Isaiah. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, and though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Okay, let me, let me stop there for the sake of time. Okay, you get the idea. Uh, you, you have gotten so used to reading this passage with Jesus in mind that it's almost impossible for you not to. Okay, but you have to remember that the people to whom it was originally written would not have read it that way. Because Jesus is nowhere on the horizon. They generally would have interpreted in the beginning that the suffering servant is Israel itself. That somehow its suffering will, you know, this is kind of one of those exilic passages, that its suffering will somehow be used by God for the redemption of humankind. And over time, it came to be interpreted not just as Israel, but as some ideal Israelite who through his suffering and death will somehow work a kind of redemption in the world. And this is also part of the faith of Israel. Okay, now we're coming to this crystal point of clarity. Uh, N.T. Wright argues absolutely convincingly to my point of view that this is the way he puts it the theological genius of Jesus uh, which by the way is already a kind of funny way to start a statement right a theological genius that's probably not the first way you think of Jesus uh, and frankly I resent it uh, you know I, I'm a theologian and I have worked really hard for my theology and Jesus is like this inside traitor uh, 
it's got all, it's kind of inside scoop. Uh, the theological genius of Jesus is this. He says, the Son of Man in Daniel 7 and the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 are the same person. And no one prior to Jesus made that connection. And in fact, Jesus then makes the audacious claim not only that the Son of Man and the suffering servant are the same one, he then claims that it's him. That's the Jesus claim. And the reason the apostles do not understand is that nothing has prepared them for the notion that the Son of Man will suffer and die. Nothing has prepared them for that. And so whenever Jesus talks about that, they get instantly and deeply confused. Okay, now, for sake of time, I'm going to show it to you in a couple of places where I can do it relatively quickly. Um, I know we're going to do Mark, but, uh, Luke, but uh, let me show it to you in Mark uh, really quickly because it's so clear. Uh, look in uh, Mark chapter 8. And uh, then we'll look at the parallel passage, uh, or look at a passage in Luke. Okay, this is a great, great passage in, in Mark 8. I'm going to start with 27 with Jesus, uh, with the confession of Peter. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea of Philippi. On the way he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Pause. Right answer or wrong answer? You can participate. Right. Okay. Right answer. And we should stop and celebrate with Peter because this is the only time in the book of Mark where he is ever right about anything. <laughs> okay. But this is Peter's big moment. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the King. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Okay, we'll find out about that in a minute. Verse 31. He then began to teach them that the, look at the language, Son of Man, right out of Daniel 7. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Okay, Peter's great moment lasted like two verses. Okay, now I've got a bone to pick with whoever wrote Mark. Let's say, let's call him Mark. Okay. Um, I wish Mark had recorded this conversation. But because he didn't, I will tell you what he said. <laughs> because this is one of the greatest moments in the Bible. When Peter accuses Jesus, are you ready for this? Of not knowing his Bible. Because Peter knows Daniel 7. And he takes Jesus aside and says, wait a minute. The Son of Man does not suffer and die. The Son of Man kicks the hated Romans out of Palestine, restores the kingdom of Israel, makes Jerusalem as the center of our universe, sits on the throne to reign forever, and by the way, puts us on little thrones all around him. That's what Peter said. Because nothing has prepared him for a dying Messiah. To which Jesus replies, when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. A little hard not to take that personally. <laughs> you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. This also happens in Mark chapter 9. It also happens in Mark chapter 10. 
three times. Jesus predicts his death, and clearly the apostles never get it because they believe he's the Son of Man. They just haven't made the connection with the suffering servant. Everybody with me? Okay, look at Luke 19 just for a second. Uh, and then when you're there, go to Luke 18, which is where it really is. <laughs> it's called being wrong. It's okay, though. Okay. Uh, look at verse 31. <coughs> Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We're going to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. There's nothing that's prepared them for this story. Um, and I'm convinced that in Acts chapter 1... Basically, they're saying, okay, we weren't ready for that dying thing, but you're back, so can we get on with it now? To which Jesus says, don't you get this? Um, the kingdom of God will not come with an army or with power. It will come with relentless, self-giving love. Not with power, but with the cross. God intends to become king of the world. Uh, okay, so those of you who are my age or older, we're going to help out the younger folks here for a minute. Uh, we're, we're, we're going to sing an old hymn, and it's not going to be just as I am. Okay, there's no invitation to this. Um, this is an old song. It's got great theology and an unfortunate tune. Okay. Um, it's about the death of Jesus. Jesus on the cross. And you get down to the chorus. And we have this line. When I do this line, all the old people are going to give me the next line. Okay. He could have called 10,000 angels, destroy the world, and set men free. Okay. Now, also the math is off. Okay. Uh, it would not have taken 10,000 angels, just one. They have ray guns. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> But <laughs> theology, dead center perfect. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world, but he didn't. Because that is not, was not, never will be God's way. Now, I don't know if you notice it, but I'm running dead head on to most American evangelical theology. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not that God so loved the world that he sent World War III. That's not how it ends. It ends with a cross and a resurrection. And this story is not just about your salvation. This story is your story. Okay, so I was trying to get Kurt and Trey at the beginning of the class to tell me a story. All right, tell me a story about these facts. Okay, this is the story about these facts. God intends to gather himself a people around a crucified Messiah. Uh, and not with power. I know we have an election Tuesday, but as Christians we're going to be relatively indifferent to that because we're going to do exactly the same thing Wednesday as we did Tuesday. We're going to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Because not by power, but by the relentless love of God, 
by self-sacrificing love, he intends to restore the world. And what Luke Acts is going to do is to show us what a people who are gathered around that story look like. And it is amazing. It is the greatest nation that ever was. Not defined by race, not defined by class, not defined by gender, but defined by the sacrificial love of God in Christ. And so it becomes our story. This is what we do. This is who we are. And um, I, I, I got to tell you, I think we get this wrong just like the apostles do. We find it hard to believe that the love of God can conquer the world. We prefer the 10,000 angels. Um, okay, that's kind of clarity number three. The call this weekend is for you to take up your cross and follow Jesus. And if you have been mostly fighting to put your sword down and take up the cross, to lay down your life the way Jesus taught us to, because we believe that as God raised him up, he'll raise us up too. Um, You know, I, had, I had an opportunity recently to spend a little time with a, with a former uh, student of mine who, who accidentally became famous. Um, Dr. Dr. Kent Brantley, is former student, old friend. And I got to tell you, Ebola was not in his life plan. Um, and... Um, it's about as horrible a thing as you can you know, just let your imagination run wild. It's probably a little worse. Um, and he gets it. He's not interested in being a celebrity. All he's interested in doing is following the one he calls Lord and Master. And when you do that, that makes the decisions for you. You become a kind of fearless person because you know as you lay your life down, God picks it up. Um, I would assume that all the speakers in one way or another are going to keep kind of running over this same point. What does a cruciform or cross-shaped community look like? Okay, so let me back up and I'm done. All right, three points I hope are just sort of crystal clear. This is about the greatest nation. This is about community not just you. Number two, being wrong feels exactly the same as being right. And once you understand that, it makes you open to understanding things you could never understand before because you say, I might be wrong. And third, the way that we most often get Jesus wrong is we want to turn, him, we want to turn the story into a story of power and what the story is really about is self sacrificial love. I want you to pause just for a moment and catch a piece of the vision that Gary was laying out for us earlier. I want you to catch a vision of a party where everyone is invited. 
And everyone is serving somebody else. Uh, I have a little group of guys I work with, and, and one of the disciplines that we sometimes do together is when we get together to eat, we have this rule that no one can serve themselves, nor can they ask anyone to serve them. So everybody in the room has to pay attention to what everybody else in the room needs. It's training so that when we walk into a room, our eyes immediately begin to move around the room and see what people need. I want you to imagine a banquet where no one has to serve themselves because everyone is being so attentive to what everyone else needs. And I want you to imagine every nation and every class, every ethnic group sitting around the table. Nobody's trying to manipulate control, or overpower, because this is not God's way. Lay in our lives there. In Luke Acts, this reality is described by the words, the kingdom of God. Sound like fun? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. To him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore, world without end. Amen.